<laughs> Am I the uh, oldest person in the room? <laughs> so, I don't know if you know, Americans, they're not that good with geography and history. So, most of us would have had to look on a map and into Wikipedia to find out what is Lithuania, just to make sure it's a country first and where it is. <laughs> but I remember it from basketball. Not just that you guys beat our dream team, but there was another big basketball victory about a decade before that. And uh, I'm a history maker, so I remember that basketball. And I also remember when I grew up, we never thought that there was going to be a Lithuania or Eastern Europe or any of these countries back out on their own. And so we did really remember, I really remember the start of the nation back in the late 1990s. So it was actually quite interesting for me to hear from your Prime Minister talking about that. And tonight, here with you, I want to thank you because probably we didn't expect there to be this kind of startup nation, this startup text, and, and I have been amazed to be here. And I really just want to start by saying thank you for having me here and uh, for introducing me to your nation and really for introducing me to your talent. And, and that's really why I came tonight. It's really not about me, I'm the old guy. I'm basically looking now for that next generation of talent. And my presentation tonight is just a little bit of background about how I've been lucky finding people like you throughout my life. And the title here is Little Insights and Big Outcomes. And some of those big outcomes have been startups that have become big companies that have really had a big impact on the world. I'm just going to share some lessons tonight. My, my first lesson is really a lesson really from my side. You guys have gotten a lot of lessons for how you should present, how you should position yourself as a startup. This is a lesson for, for angels. And the first lesson is it's, it's a lot better to be lucky than smart. Uh, this, this goes very closely with the second lesson. There, there is no second lesson, you just really need to stick with the first one. There really is only one lesson, which is just be lucky. And so the real question is, what does it mean to be lucky? So let's go back in time. Let's start with some definitions. So, so luck really means finding and backing insights rather than just ideas. And, and that idea word has been thrown around a lot over the weekend about how you should share them and not be too possessive. We tend to think of ideas as they're really good things. We, we have them all the time. Good ideas, bad ideas. Ideas are sort of, we say, a dime a dozen. So what's the difference between an idea and an insight? Well, that insight is really, sorry, the idea is really a product of mental activity. You know, you, you, you thunk it right up here. But an insight is something it's a bit more subtle, it's a bit more inner. It's about seeing the inner nature of things. It might be something that you see or feel with your gut. And so when you're looking for the things as an angel investor or just looking at things, whoever you are, that might have that really big impact in the world, both financially, socially, at whatever level, they're often based on something that is closer to an insight which may have very little to do with something technical or high-tech. It, it might have something much more to do with human nature or sociology. So those are all words and definitions. These are the people that really know. Does anybody know who, who these people are? Yeah. Cowboy, that is, that is a cowboy. <laughs> and, and no, that's not me. He's, he's older than me. <laughs> And on the right, this, this guy was the host of the Academy Awards a couple of times. That's Billy Crystal. And, and this movie is City Slickers. And does anybody here know what a dude ranch is? You don't have dude ranches here in Lithuania. 
<laughs> Dude ranches is when city slickers who don't know shit about what you do outside on the farm. They go out and they stay on what's called a dude ranch, and somebody who really knows what's going on shows them the ropes so they can feel for a weekend like they're a real cowboy. <laughs> and so this is a lesson between the real cowboy and the city slicker. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean shit. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you gotta figure out. You're supposed to laugh, but that's, that's what you have gotta figure out because I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty bad at it. <laughs> or else, so, oh, no. if I was better at it, I would be sitting where you are and you would still be on the stage. Because these insights, these one things that need to be figured out, those are the jewels that happen here and there in history. And you know, the main thing that you want to see happen is to have that insight, not get lost, not get missed, or not get forgotten. So what do we need to do? To make sure that insights don't get forgotten or unheard. Well, this page here was for a company that, not my company, but when I had to take my company out, which we're going to talk about, and I took it on the road show to raise, not venture capital, but to raise capital to take that company public on the NASDAQ, I had a company with the idea and the insight behind it. People were pretty skeptical. But I was fortunate. Someone in my industry, in a related part, had gone before me. And, and this person got their insight while they were still in school. And they had the temerity, they had the, the thought to write about it for their class and give it into their professor. And, and this is what the professor wrote on their paper. He said, the concept is interesting and well-formed, but in order to earn higher than a C minus, it must be feasible. Wow. What would it feel like if you gave your presentation? This, this, sounds, this sounds more depressing than Yuri, right? <laughs> being told to put your team page, you know, up front, you know. <laughs> and this was from a Yale professor, comments on an undergraduate economics paper submitted by a guy named Fred Smith. Is it, does, does anybody in here know who Fred Smith is? And what this idea was? That X. That X. This, this, this was the idea. Which press? When it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. He had the dumbest idea. In a country where you could send something across the country in two to three days for 25 cents, he said if you just charged 100 times as much, $25, <laughs> and shipped it overnight, people would use it. And the professor thought, that is such a stupid <laughs> idea. And maybe it was a bad idea, but, but Fred Smith had an insight. And his insight was that, hey, sometimes people really need to get something there the next morning. If it's your application for the university and you just waited a little too long, if it's that key thing that you... Does any of you stay up late last night? You guys all probably went to bed pretty early. If <laughs> that last minute thing that you had to get in, it's probably worth $25 to do something that might change your life. And in fact, those moments happen a lot and FedEx became you know, the success in the overnight career industry that we've all heard of. Now, I was in the courier industry too. Although once again, I was a bad courier. But the fortunate thing is when you're a bad courier, you look around for ideas because you know if you can't teach, you know, those who can't do teach, and those who can't teach, teach gym. So so that's how you end up in management. Because you know? you're not good at you're not good at doing courier work, you're not good at answering the phone, you're not good at marketing. So what you need is people who have insights. 
and, and so this is the story of not Tom, Dick, and Harry, but Tom, Jack, and Jim. And from each of them, I'm going to learn a lesson. And just like I've been looking to learn lessons from you tonight. Now Tom, Tom kind of looked like this. This, this in America is a, is a bike messenger. They're sort of part of the anarchist, tattoo, lots of piercing, underground. They're, they're, they're pretty, pretty grungy lot. And they're the last kind of people you think you're gonna have, A, high tech, and B, something to do that's gonna get funded by venture capital or even be a public company on the NASDAQ. And a little bit more background on these people. I don't know if you have these messengers here in Vilnius anymore, but this is, a, this is kind of what it was like in the US a little ways back. You had, you had this whole group of kind of people on the edge, and they kind of, they kind of behave like Not necessarily a fungible idea. <laughs> but these guys got things from A to B, and getting things from A to B, not overnight, across the country, but from one side of the city to the other, it was just kind of one of those things that you need to get done. And messengers are good at getting things there in an hour, sometimes a half hour. But how do you like control these guys. They're out of control. Look at them. <laughs> they look like some of you. <laughs> so there's the answer. Soviet model. You must have five-year plan, five-minute plan. Tell everyone what to do. You do this, you do that, this, that. You must have a mathematical operational top-down formula, or you might try a different approach. Like, like, I ended up in New Zealand, down there on an assignment back when I still used to wear suits and be like, you know, part of that crowd. But I met these guys because I needed a bike to do a 100-mile ride, and I was out of the country, and they said, hey, just go see the messenger company. They'll probably lend you a bike. And one of these guys, 19-year-old guy who was an aspiring bike racer, he was running this company in a way that looked a little funny to me. I went in there, because I'd seen these bike messengers in New York, and they were like crazy. In his back office, there was no technology. He was on the radio. He was calling out the work and not telling anyone what to do. He just put it out there. And anyone who wanted to follow that work and call for it, could call for it. And it was like an auction. And I never thought that, you know, well, doesn't that mean that those, those insane people out there, it's like, isn't that what it means when you say the inmates are running the asylum? Or well, aren't they too lazy? You know, you call out the work and nobody calls to do it. Well, you know, he just said, oh, you know, we never thought about doing it the other way. We always just thought that this is the only way to do it. That, that, you know, people want to get paid, and so they don't call for work they can't do because they obviously won't get paid for it. So, uh, of course it's an auction. We just call it out and keep track of who did what. But there was a problem. You could only do so many deliveries a day before everybody's head blew up. The dispatcher, the couriers, there's a lot to keep track of. Who had what delivery, who gets paid, etc. So the question was, what would it be like if you built some software that took this and made this auction environment not just an operational system, but, but a system system that handled the dispatching, the problem resolution, the inbound calls from the customers, the clearing and settlement. What if you did all those things and built a center like this and had the insight that the way the world should work for transportation logistics is not based on allocation, but on free call. That inmates running the asylum is not anarchy, it's just called the marketplace. 
and the marketplace might be better than any top-down system. Now, it did take some technology. So, first you had to change your mind about letting this be bottom-up rather than top-down. Secondly, you needed a way to get that information out there. So, in addition to the radios and trying to communicate everything by voice, maybe you only needed to make the decision by voice, but all the details could be packaged up in a text message. Originally a one-way text message, but hey, these couriers, they, they got thumbs. They can send back and say, yeah, I delivered the package. It's done now, and John Smith signed for it. Right? So two-way pagers. But you know, you can't put a lot of information on a pager. You can only kind of put 140 characters on a pager. And every pager was different in every city. So you had to build a gateway. So we built a gateway because we needed to get that data onto pagers. Don't worry about this picture. All this picture means is that for every customer, for every courier firm, in every city, you need to pay every courier who works for every courier fleet, for every courier firm in every city. Which just means that somewhere along the way, even if you're pretty bad at math and accounting like I was, you need to keep track of the money in and the money out and build a clearing and settlement system. So if you take changing your attitude, communication to wireless data devices and a clearing and settlement system, you might be able to build something that doesn't just work in Wellington, New Zealand, in a country of oh, about three or four million people with a capital city of about half a million. Anybody recognize another country kind of about that size? But you might be able to build a real-time dispatch system for the world. It goes from having that 10 people in Wellington, New Zealand, to about 6,000 people across all the major cities of the world. From Perth, Australia, to Edinburgh, with all the big cities in between. It might have, instead of a couple of thousand dollars in revenue, it might have $225 million a year in revenue. It might have a 60-city footprint. And it might mean that for years on the lead-up when you were providing the software, some guy in a suit comes by and says, you know, if you just bought all your customers, you'd have a hell of a big company. And I said, but you know, all I got is a credit card. He says, oh, that's where those finance guys are from. That's when you gotta like watch your wallet. One of these guys that looks like me comes in, he says, I'm here to help. And, and it did help. So, so this is the dream that six companies out of a million make it to an America. Six startups in a million make it to a public offering in America. Okay. So a lot of what you've been hearing about is getting to the venture capital piece. This is a story that in seven years from start to IPO, resulted not in a Facebook, but in what was back then, and you know, you raised $70 million or something, that used to be a lot of money before, you know, we got into these, you know, billions and trillions days. <laughs> and so this is the company that I took public, and it never would have happened without the insight of Tom. And what Tom did was he took six months to teach me the career business, so I and some other good tech talent could write the software to imitate what he was just doing with his heart and head and legs. Now, what was his end of the deal? He got to go live with my mom in America <laughs> because I used to race bicycles there and he wanted to be a pro bike racer. I says, you can go live with my mom and ride on my old team. So we just switched positions. And you know, at the time, I thought he did a much better job as a bike racer than I did at like running a career company. But fortunately, I didn't focus on running a career company. I focused on finding the next entrepreneur, not in Wellington, but in Auckland, city after city, and basically showing them the system and helping them come to their own insight about what it would look like if they changed their way of doing business and seeing life. And, and you know, the funny thing about insights as opposed to ideas is that until the insight clicks in the person that's sitting across from you, it's kind of like you're in two different worlds. So, so the problem was, we used to fly people from different cities that just didn't believe this thing could work. Like in Detroit, it says, you cannot do this in Detroit. Right? You cannot do this in Detroit. Or New York City, this will not work. Right? 
you fly them there and they make one of two mistakes when they see your insight working in action. And, and both are dangerous mistakes. The first is they look and they say, that is amazing software. If you give me that software, I can kick ass. They think it's all about the software. The second is they draw the exact opposite conclusion. They look and they say, oh, you just have incredible people. It's nothing to do with the software. Just watching the people that are using your system, they're just incredible people. Now, those are both big mistakes. Because there was an insight behind what we were doing, we changed the way we thought about things and then built a system around it, we had an entirely different paradigm that was a combination of software and operations. It was a whole new way of thinking and doing things. And you couldn't have the one without the other. You couldn't have the people without the system or the system without the people. And the people that came to that conclusion, just give me the software, or, oh, your people are amazing, they weren't the right ones to drink the Kool-Aid with us. They, they were still in idea land, and they had the wrong idea. But those people that drank the Kool-Aid, they got to come along for the journey. And it was a magnificent journey, because we just changed and turned upside down the world. When I came to the industry, the way it worked was they had women answering the phones, taking orders, men giving out instructions because they were the dispatchers telling people what to do. Now, those dispatchers in the old days, they were great tellers and they were bad listeners. The women were good listeners. Well, by the time the system came in, the way auctions work is the auctioneer needs to listen to what people are bidding for the jobs. And so it all changed around. By the time we left, it was like the star-bellied sneeches. Does anybody know who the star-bellied sneeches are? It was a world by Dr. Seuss in which half the people had stars, the other half didn't, and the ones who had stars got to go to hot dog roast, and the others, uh, they just got to sit out and got to dink. Until Sylvester Mc Monkey McBean came, and he had a machine that would put stars on your belly. And pretty soon, everybody had stars on. And those, those, those sneeches that used to have stars, they wanted those stars off. So Sylvester McMonkey McBean, he brought in another machine to take the stars off. And pretty soon every sneech was in a line, either getting a star on and getting a star off until there was no more money. And this Sylvester McMonkey McBean, he left, he left with all the stars. And, and pretty much half had it on and half had it off. Well, you have to go through your, your Dr. Seuss moments and, and figure out what kind of person you're going to be, whether you're going to drink the Kool-Aid and become part of the new insight. Well, even successes are ultimately, at some time, our failures. That's why I said today, well, you can leave or get fired. It doesn't really matter. But, but to every one of these stories, it, it, it doesn't last forever. I know in the fairy tales and in, in Hollywood, it, it all adds. But, but, but my story as taking a company public, it was really about the journey. When we got there, this damn Russia went bankrupt and defaulted on its debt. What the hell does that have to do with white messengers? Well, once you go public, you publish your numbers, and if your numbers say you're going to buy 30 companies this year and you're going to borrow this much money to do it, you better buy 30 companies and borrow that much money. But if somebody's defaulted on their debt and all the credit markets lock up and you can't complete your deals because no bank is going to lend for anything, you're going to miss your numbers, Everybody's going to panic. You're still profitable. You're still this biggest number one player, but everybody runs for the trenches. And they all go back to saying, like, well, maybe we should go back to doing what we used to know how to do. Maybe we should, and this was the, uh, this was the, this was the saying of my rival who, who went out and says, ride the horse in the direction it's going. So instead of trying to be the person that tells the horse where to go. Let the horse do the thinking. <laughs> so I left. I quit. If I didn't quit, they probably would have fired me. Because, you know, one of the dirty little secrets of startups is when you take your company public, if you're very, very successful, by the time you do, if you're lucky, to have 5% of your own company. So you're not really working for your own company. Even if you have all these titles, even if you have stationery, 
You're working for the man. And you're like, but I'm the man. I'm like, no, no, man. The, the public's the man. You know? They're your boss. They are the boss of you. If you go that route. That route that so many people hold out their ass as the prize. So luckily for me, two people went with me. You know, the other 5,998, 5, they stayed behind. Because it was safe and it was good and everyone was still getting paid. But I took two coders. I never understood what these coders were saying, but they were good. <laughs> So I was a failure. Yes. So back to lesson time. Failures can lead to insights. So does anybody know who Mr. Fosbury is? He, he was a failure at 16. He did not make the high school track team. He could not even clear five feet. So he did not make the team. He couldn't get over five feet. So he had to think of something different. This, this is what he came up with. The 1968 Olympic Games proved to be a turning point in the history of the high jump event. Into the Mexico City Olympic Arena came not only a new name to the sport, but a new approach, which was to revolutionize the high jump event. Dick Fosbury from the United States demonstrated a new style of high jump, which some considered strange and awkward. It was a jump he had devised in the previous years, and one which unsettled his opponents. While the crowd at first saw him as a novelty, his continued success at clearing the ever-increasing height soon made it apparent he was a serious contender. Valentin Gavrov from the Soviet Union failed at his attempt of 2.22 meters while Fosbury and his U.S. teammate, Edward Carruthers, cleared their way to a jump-off. The bar sat at 2.24. Carruthers failed, and Fosbury took his new style of high jump over the bar and into the history books. Fosbury had won his gold. Within a few years, the Fosbury flock had become the standard method of jumping in this great Olympic sport. I went backwards. <laughs> you weren't even born. <laughs> but this never would have happened if he didn't fail and have to come up with a new way of jumping. It just happened he went on to, to win the gold and set the, uh, the world record for the high jump. Here's another guy that he didn't get listened to by his, his bosses. He's got one of these unpronounceable names from over here. Can anybody <laughs> pronounce his name for me? Does anybody know who this guy is? He's a geek! That's all you got. Geek! <laughs> <laughs> you can't even tell you can't even tell him. He's a geek! <laughs> so, so this guy was a mathematician geek, right? And he wrote a paper Uh, that's a mouthful. Method of edge waves in the physical theory of diffraction. Okay. I didn't know what it meant either, but, but the picture helps. Okay. So he noticed that when you have a shadow, you put a light on one side and there's a shadow, the shadow isn't all black, and then the part that's not in the shadow, all white. There, there's, there's an edge where some of the black is a little gray and some of the white is a little dark. And, and what that means is that light is either all the wave or all the particle. It bends around the object it's going on. But there's a property called diffraction. And what he hypothesized was that works for light also works for sound. That traditional sound, if you send it at an object, a solid object, it just bounces back. And because it just bounces straight back, that's what makes radar possible. And you know, obviously if you angle the surface a little bit, it won't bounce straight back. And if you like play around with those angles, it might bounce all over the place. And his boss said, "What the hell? What kind of good, what good is that?" And I did it. Just says you you make the shapes, funny shapes, and, and the sound just bounces off in all sorts of unpredictable directions. 
that is the most useless thing. If you keep working on this, you are going to go nowhere. And he's like, well, can I publish my paper? Why not? It's a useless paper. Go ahead and publish it. So, you, you don't get to publish that much in the Soviet Union. So, you know, some of us are Americans. We're not very good at math. You've probably heard Americans are not that very good at school. But we are great plagiarizers. So, somewhere over there in one of those many U.S. security things, read this paper, and they said, you know, that's an interesting insight. We probably could do something with that. We could, we could build one of these. <laughs> because, because it would be invisible. And, and all that money spent on air defense and, and weaponry, like, we wouldn't need a big fleet, we'd only need a couple of planes, and we could build a small military that was invisible and it would change the balance of the Cold War. Because stealth would transform the whole race of building more and more missiles, because if everybody just did that to kind of play this game of mutually assured destruction. That game got totally unbalanced by stealth. It transformed the economics of the Cold War, and it made it totally economically impractical to keep pursuing the strategy on the Soviet side of building large, large, large defenses because you could never defend them against stealth. And so that entire technological direction for the United States was enabled by the Soviets because their own leadership did not recognize the insights that were produced by their own best people. Thank goodness for this one. Insights are often simple. Now this one, this one I have almost a chance at. Oh, no I don't, because I never wrote a patent. Now this patent, this looks very imposing. The United States patent. And because of the tough surface here, you can't read this, but that's part of my little trick here. This patent was written by a guy who worked with another chap who came from this part of the world. And this patent, had this really simple algorithm. <laughs> it's not really even an algorithm. It's like, we, we know it from like this democracy thing, which is what you should do to figure out which web page is like really important is you should count how many other web pages point to it. We, 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 this highly mathematical technical concept, we have a name for it in America. It's called voting. Whoever gets the most votes wins. Whichever web page gets the most links to it, Wins. So does anybody know what this, this is? PageRank. This is PageRank. And it made this company possible. <laughs> Let's go back to <laughs> Get them. <laughs> simple, simple idea. The fundamental insight behind Google that was so different from all of these to all those others were doing all this super duper heavy math. Now I'm not saying there's not a lot of other math at Google, but the fundamental insight is measure authority, not frequency. Frequency in terms of word count and all these other semantic type things. Measure the rank by human beings choosing to link to another page because they think it's worth linking to and rank everything on that basis. Okay. <laughs> Who's a dropout in here? You can, you can, all right. Oh man, you guys all went to school? Well, I got news for you. All you went to school, you're like me. You're, you're gonna probably be a loser. Because <laughs> I'm gonna show you the, the hall of dropouts. Who's this guy? Where did he drop out from? No, we need college, dinky college, good college. <laughs> But the dude had an insight. What was his insight? It's really, you're not even going to think this is an insight. His insight was computers can be personal. <laughs> <laughs> it was an insight. Up till then, computers were like, you know, in big corporations, in big military. You didn't have a computer in your home. You know, that's like saying, 
I want to have a personal bazooka. No, no, you don't <laughs> have bazookas for personal use, except maybe in Michigan and a few other places. That's <laughs> See why that's not an idea? Computers are personal. That's not an idea. That is an insight. <laughs> this guy is even geekier. <laughs> I need to get glasses that big. Who is that? Hey, hey. Another. What, a, what a simple one operating system for all PCs. Clearly, someone must have thought about that before. As no. Wrong. It was, it was a new insight. He didn't write DOS. You can't blame that on him. He bought it for $50,000 and licensed it to IBM and others. Because he had an insight that instead of doing a roll your own to run your brand of personal computers, just license this thing. And he was clever enough to license it and not sell it. That was a big insight. Because it turned the operating system into a platform that everyone else, you know. Man, this guy's like your age. What, 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 what was his insight? People are willing to share all sorts of stuff that you wouldn't believe they'd share. Like, like it seems so obvious now, but back then everybody was like a dog on the internet. He's turned people into real identities because they share all the stuff they used to keep private. And he got them to do it willingly. He didn't, you know, didn't have to trick them or anything. They just, they just went ahead and loaded it up there. <laughs> Nobody knows who that guy is, huh? That's no problem. That's some guy who put his finger in the light socket. I'll give you a hint. This guy was on that, that page back then. He came from that era all those crazy bike messengers. And he had tattoos. And he had, he had piercings in place I cannot share. <laughs> <laughs> and he had an insight. He saw that if free call for couriers to follow through and pick the jobs they wanted to pick could work, He spent a lot of time telling me about ants. Not just an individual. It's not like he had a pet ant. He, he used to like to watch all the ants. And he opined to me about how ants and the picnic basket work. That, that an ant finds the picnic basket, he gets all the goodies, he comes back, and he has these like little pheromones on his feet, and he leaves a trail on the way back. And, and he comes back to the hive, and the other ants say, whoa, man, what's that great stuff you're eating? But the ants can't talk, you know. But they, they see, like, smells really good, like, oh, a picnic basket. And, and, like, ants can't tell you, like, well, this is how you get to the picnic basket. But he left that trail, like Hansel and Gretel, so the other ants could go back and find that, that picnic basket. And that's how ants work as a social network. And that was an insight on top of the insight from Tom. This was Jack's insight, was that why not give anyone the freedom to follow not just a courier job, but any piece of information that was dispatched out there with free call. He cleans up well. <laughs> Jack Dorsey. I was very lucky that when I left the 6,000 person firm, he was one of those two guys I took. And there were some lean years in there. It was so bad I even went back to school to get another one of those useless degrees. But we kept plugging away. He kept hacking away. Oh, how did I meet him in the first place? I didn't hire him because he had a resume. He hacked into my system <coughs> when he lived in St. Louis and was still at school and like his nappies told me all the things that were insecure about my system. And, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. You could have called the authorities, but I, told her, so I said, of course, you're hired, you smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I would have said, just get on a plane. But I got to check with your mother that I'm not going to get you in trouble for having you drop out of school. And please come out here and join us because you got your shit together. And uh, unfortunately, he did. I, I was worried that it would be bad for him, like <coughs> leaving college. And, and, and he said, no, it's not bad. I, I left my friend to look after the college. <laughs> he, he was worried what the college was going to do without him to make sure the computer was <laughs> It was 19 years ago. He was full of piss, but he, he, was, he was on. Right? Like, you just knew that this guy, who at the time was so shy and stuttered so much, you could never imagine him speaking in public. This is what he created. Simple insight here. 
And where this has gotten to is Jack's now the chairman. The thing we're sort of happiest about, or I'm happiest about, was we have our version of the Academy Awards. It's called the Crunchies. And Twitter this year was voted the most social impact in the world, primarily because of the year of spring. We're signing up 500,000 new users a day. And uh, at the we raised uh, $800 million from the Russian DST fund and uh, a further 300 million from the Saudis. And that's good news to me because because I can't take responsibility for any of this. I was just lucky enough that during the lean times, when there was nothing to be made from cutting code, Jack helped me because I had a newborn baby and he was a nanny with me. We didn't, we didn't have a job. The women were out working in the real job. We were only looking at the, after the baby and we're kicking these ideas around. And so, so I know him as much from the guy that helped me change the nappies. But it did mean that when the idea came and I got to invest, I got to invest at that initial round, which was uh, $20 million pre-money valuation. And you can do the math between $20 million and $8 billion. <laughs> So that's better than 10 to 1. So I'm a lucky guy. And I want to let uh, Jack talk about two things that are going to be helpful, I hope, for you. Both one for pitching and two for running your company. Because that guy that was the geeky, shy guy, he, he, he ain't so geeky anymore. The biggest thing for me on that, on that path is I need to... I need to draw something out, and I need to get it out of my head. I found myself very early on thinking about something, like you know, thinking about this this early idea for Twitter, and saying to myself, "I could build this awesome." You know, you, you have those like shower moments where you're walking at midnight in some town in New York City, and you've got these amazing brand ideas, and and then you start thinking, well. I could really start doing this if only X, and if I had this person, or if this technology existed, or if this happened or this happened. And what I what I realized I was doing is I constantly making excuses for not working on it. And then the window had passed, and then I couldn't do anything. So I think it's really really important um, to write it out, or to draw it out, or to code it. Um, but you need to get it out of your head. And the reason you have to get it out of your head is you need to be able to see it on a surface that is not in your mind. And once you can see it, once you can step back from it, then you can also decide, uh, this is, you know, this passes my filter, passes my, you know, constraints, so maybe I can show it and share it with some other people. And then they'll be like, uh, you know, that's the stupidest idea ever. And, or, you know, that's somewhat interesting, um, but maybe this and this and this. Um, so the sooner you can do that, then you have a lot of momentum around it and you can you know, really decide if you want to commit to it and work on it more or put it on the shelf for a later date. And the realization that I think everyone needs to have about that latter option, putting it on the shelf, is that you can come back to it and it'll, it'll surface back up in another piece of work or another idea at some point in your life. So you know, having, that, having that ability to close off a chapter and move on is really, really important. You can't have all these open threads, and, and that's what I realized I was doing. And, and that also encouraged me to, to really write more and to really think about, you know, what is, what is the story? What, how are people coming to this? And like when I show my friends this, how are they going to react? And I would write it down. I, I would actually treat it like a play. Uh, and, and, and when I realized that I was writing plays, I, wrote, I read a lot more plays um, for style and for substance and for technique. And um, I think it's, you know, I think it's, I think it's really good. And I think there's another company that I've always looked towards for um, inspiration. And uh, I know a number of people in this room probably have uh, a, a similar company in mind, which is Apple. Um, Apple, I think, is run like a theater company. Uh, it has a great sense of pacing, has a great sense of story, and has a great sense of execution, and it's all about, it's all event driven, it's all stage driven. The stage being a billboard, or the stage being a keynote, or the stage being a product launch. Um, all of it has a very, very cohesive end to end story. When you think about what happened when Steve Jobs came back to the company, the first thing he did is he killed 
every product line the company was working on. And for two, two years, they had no product on the market whatsoever. All they had were a bunch of posters all around the world with Steve's heroes. And it said, think different. And it was just focused on bringing up the brand and making people aware of the brand again and how the brand is aligning to this particular feeling and story. And then they came out with the iMac and then um, built, built iTunes and then the iPod and they realized that, wait a minute, people are carrying music on their phones now so we better build a phone, an iPhone. And so this, this unfolding of the plot and the epic story is, has been very, very interesting to watch, especially if you look back you know, to that, that time when you came back um, to the company. So I've learned a lot from that company um, and other companies who operate in a similar fashion. But by editorial, I mean there are a thousand things that we could be doing, but there's only one or two that are important. And all of these ideas and all of these stories from our users, from engineers, from support people, from designers, are going to constantly flood what, what we should be doing. And we need to choose the one or two that are really going to drive and sustain the network and the service and the product. And as an editor, I'm effectively just the chief editor of the company, as an editor, I'm constantly taking all these inputs and deciding on that one or that intersection of a few that makes sense for what we're doing. And there's three access points that I pay attention to in particular. Number one is the team. We have to bring the best people in, edit the best people in so we have a good cast of characters, and edit away any negative elements. And, and a lot of this is just like, you know, the timing is off and, you know, our relationship does, just doesn't matter, so just doesn't match. So in some cases we have to ask people to leave or they, they leave on their own, but it's, it's always minding that team dynamic because at the end of the day, we're just a group of people working on one single goal. And if we can't step in a cohesive, coordinated fashion, then we're gonna trip all over the place. And that's, that's a messy company and no one wants to use that. Number two, so recruiting is number one. Number two is internal and external communication. Internal communication is just the coordination around what we're doing and why we're doing it and what our goals are and why the goals are like that. That's it. If you have that sort of high level, this is where we're going, this is the vision, this is the next 30 days and three months and six months and a year maybe, uh, it makes it very, very easy to set priorities and for all the edges of the company to set their own priorities to do the right thing. And the external communication is the product. The product is the story we're telling the world. And we want to put everything through this. We don't want it to be about a person. We want it to be about how people are using it and what people, how people are fitting it into their lives and what they're doing with it. That's the strongest story we have. So number two is that internal and external communication. And number three is editing the money in the bank story. And this comes in two ways. It comes through investment and taking money from investors, either through swiping their credit cards um, while they're not looking, or through revenue. And fortunately, Square is a company that has revenue from day one, um, so we can look at constantly building that, and we don't have to worry about much investment, but we can focus on that, that revenue piece. So my three priorities and my focus areas are in that order, and that's what I'm constantly editing as, as a CEO. Um, and I think it makes, it makes managing a growing company and a fast-paced movement very, very easy um, because there's basically one thing that you have to do. You have to make every single detail perfect and you have to limit the number of details. That's it. Every detail perfect, limit the number of details. If you can do that well, no matter where you are in the org structure, no matter where you are in the company or organization, you're going to succeed because you're paying attention to the smallest things. And if you pay attention to the smallest things while knowing what's important, then 
and everything else takes care of itself. We managed to get thrown out of Twitter. So I kind of left or kind of booted myself out of my other company. Early on in Twitter, Jack wasn't at this level yet. Jack was somewhere halfway in between being the shy, geeky coder and the guy that you see now able to make those observations about storytelling and about priorities as a CEO. We were still learning. I don't know if you heard the early story of Twitter, but it had a terrible user interface. And it was broken all the time. And we had no idea where we were going. We had it hooked up to instant messenger. We had it hooked up to, we tried hooking it up to everything. If there was a cow outside, we would have hooked it up to a cow. <laughs> he didn't get that much traction that quickly. And like, I didn't really understand what it was about. I mean, I was with everybody else. He says, yeah, well, I made a burrito for lunch. But you know, the light bulb went off for me when we ran a poetry contest. And, and just to be clear, I'm not really into poetry. But this poetry contest meant that people were sending in six word poems, like haiku. And each day we would tweet back out, you know, the best. And, and they were pretty inspiring. Like one of my favorites was graduated Harvard, Married a crackhead. <laughs> or, or one that's pretty relevant for some of my friends from the other side of the track. Got up, got taser, went home. <laughs> you know, when people follow these, and there was a small but loyal followership. But we didn't know what to do. We had too many ideas, and this peering down had not yet happened. And so thankfully, Ev, who was one of the other co-founders, who'd been through a period with his startup, Blogger, during the dot-com bus where everybody he'd been in his team had to quit or be fired because there was no money, and he ran the business from a Unix machine sitting on his kitchen table until it kind of caught on and got kind of up to that tens of millions of user bases when Google sweeped in and bought them. Ev knew what it was like to get through the lean period. And, and so for a period of time, Ev stepped in, get more shares because he put up more money. Jack didn't have any money, and I had about two cents. And we were out. So after getting booted out of my company and booted out of Twitter, what are you gonna do? You gotta go back and find those same old friends that you like screwed up with before in life. We went back and we found the guy that Jack worked for before he worked for me when he was like, I mean he was like not even in diapers yet. He was like 15 or 16 and he worked for this guy, Jim. Jim, remember Jim? Tom Dick and Harry. Jim was the third guy in that first first job. <coughs> Jim was another guy with an insight. Jim was not a coder. Jim was a he was sort of an angry artist businessman. He was a guy that was a glass blower. And uh, he made these uh, $2,000 faucets. How do you make a $2,000 faucet? You make it out of glass. Or like, you know, if you used his plumbing for your toilet, you, know, you can see the poops going through the glass. <laughs> people would pay for that stuff, you know, because people, it's America, man. <laughs> Jim did not like to miss a sale. And so when someone was leaving the country to go back to Brazil and wanted one of his products, and only had like a personal check and didn't have uh, cash, Jim lost the sale. He said, God damn it, why can't I take a credit card payment? Like, why do I need some fancy special terminal? Like, why can't I just take it with my phone? I got this smart thing here, it's got all this processing power, I ought to be able to take a payment with a phone. So, you know, we're sitting there eating fish and chips, and the Pelican Inn out of my house across, warm beer, bad British food. And Jim is lamenting his ability, not the ability to make a payment with a phone, 
but to Tinkapan it would come. And sort of the insight there was like, everybody and their brother and dog is working about how to make payments and with phones, the mobile wallet. But it didn't seem like anybody was trying to figure out how to take a payment with a phone. And uh, you know, so there was that technical challenge, which Jim was sort of on to. And then Jack had his insight. And uh, you know, Jack is a man of few words. And, and Jack said to me, because I was like the adult at the table, because once I went to work for the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. for two years in the payments division, to learn how payments work in America, because I never figured it out while I was running my company. And so, so I was supposed to be the adult. And, and, uh, and Jack said something to me that in two years at the Federal Reserve, and if I'd stayed there 20 years, I never would have heard. And he said to me, he said it to me very seriously. He said, Greg, payments are very intimate. <laughs> And uh, I learned by this time, you know, just not to say anything right away because, you know, the last time I like kind of laughed when he first came up with Twitter, I ended up looking pretty stupid, but at least I invested. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, uh, I said, Jack, do you, do you want to elaborate? And he says, well, you know, you don't pay someone unless you trust them. And, and that makes sense, but you know, nobody had ever talked that way at the Federal Reserve, you know, where we write all these regs and we run the ACH system and the check clearing system and all the bank vaults and run monetary policy or misrun it or screw it all up for the rest of the world. <laughs> and, and what Jack was saying is that the process of payments is generally a painful process. I, I don't know if there are any proctologists in the room, but, 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 but that is a butt doctor. And, and I hate butt doctors, and, and Jack had intimated that up till now, payments felt like having a butt exam. They were not fun, they were not intimate, they were not personal. That the whole experience of payments was wrong, and that you weren't going to fix that from the side that was making the payment. You're going to have to charge, change the side that's taking the payment. Meanwhile, Jim is over there still steaming that he lost that $2,000 sale. And all they ask me is like, is it legal to do this? And I'm like, no, but it didn't stop you with Twitter, so why should that stop you now? <laughs> I, I just basically gave them permission to say, you know, PayPal broke the rules some way. They figured out how to do it for the 6% of commerce that's online. And Jack was like, well, what about the other 94% that's not online? And I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's, that's pretty clever. <laughs> and this has nothing to do with technology again, any more than the insight behind Twitter it had nothing to do with technology. We were unable or unsuccessful raising money for Twitter from Silicon Valley because there was no proprietary technology. There was no secret sauce. When we would come to the venture capitalists, they would say, is that it? You're just going to send 140 characters <laughs> to the pager and let anybody follow them that they want. And, and that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was before the meeting when I asked, I said, Jack, you know, uh, you know, these text messages, they're, they're free for the people to receive, but you know, they cost us money to send. <laughs> That's called like a, well, they have names for that in business school. But, you know, fortunately, Jack didn't go to business school. So Jack sat there, and you, know, you can see he was thinking about it, and he says, yeah, I don't know what to do about that. And we're like, oh, whew, glad we figured that out. <laughs> So we had an absolute negative margin business that scaled to absolute bankruptcy. Right? So it, was like, it was a terrible business model. Not only a no revenue business model, but an absolute negative every time they send in a message. And in the, like somebody follows like 100,000 followers, 10p a message in the UK, because Tony Blair said something, that's $10,000 to deliver a message. Right? That, is, that is the rocket ship to insanity. So, but 
the insight was like, well, let's not worry about it. That's only going to be a problem when we get a lot of users. <laughs> well, that made me feel a lot better. <laughs> it was actually good because when they started getting some users, that's how I got a job at Twitter. I said, what's my job going to be? And they said, well, you know all those phone companies that are charging us you know, all that money, because I'm like, was it getting bad? I said, yeah, the, the text message bill is bigger than the payroll. And I said, well, what do you want me to do about it? I said, well, just figure out how to get them to pay us instead of us paying them. <laughs> I failed. So, failure is a constant, constant thing here. But, but the point is, is, is you don't have to solve every problem. And the only money in the world ain't just in Silicon Valley. We were lucky that we went to those people in New York who don't know nothing about technology. But they're like, this is a great media company. And we're like, yeah, media company. Good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what color is your checkbook? Green, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, with the Twitter thing, you know, we, we, we just learned that you can be, you know, stupid and, you know, and, and not focus on the technology, not focus on the idea, but if you stay focused on the insight, because there was a really powerful insight. In a country where the First Amendment is about freedom of speech, blah, 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 blah. You know what freedom of speech is? Freedom of speech is you gotta sit here and listen to me go on and on and on and on and on. And we got, you know, in case you were wondering, the doors are locked. There's no way out. It's like, a, it's like an email box without spam control. It just keeps coming in. In the world of mass media, in a world of asymmetrical communication where one spam bot can send out da 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 people go bam, 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 bam. Americans, we can talk. The freedom to choose who you want to listen to freedom to follow, that's empowering. That's empowering. Because when people talk that you don't want to listen to anymore, I ain't following you. You can talk all you want, but that person who wrote, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, did it make a sound? Well, that becomes kind of like the real First Amendment. That becomes the real principle of communication. And for someone who's in the media business, you start to realize that Twitter maybe isn't a social network. It isn't a microblogging site. It's a new form of communication that is very good for one to many, but it lets the listeners decide who's worth listening to. And that powerful insight, it's different from Facebook. Facebook is great. It's about like friends and stuff. But Twitter's insight about followers works in a world where everything is public unless you make it private, where Facebook is in a world where everything's private, unless you make it public, until you kind of realize that, hey man, it wasn't really private. <laughs> but, but conceptually, it's two different views of the world. They're both really powerful and they're really complementary. But, but the point is, these insights are not technological. They're more often sociological and they're more often about a feeling Feeling from the heart. And so in, in this case, that that meal over that warm British beer and that food led to a second act. You use your card to pay at restaurants and department stores. But what about a taco truck or a flower stand? or even to pay back a friend who spotted you for lunch. Square is a simple way for anyone to take payments by credit or debit card, or even prepay your gift card. With just a mobile device, and one of these little things plugged into your audio jack. Here's how it works. This is Jason. Jason came by because he likes my couch and he wants to buy it from me. Now, because I've already gone through the simple process of signing up with Square, Jason can pay me for my couch using just his card. All I need is my iPhone and my card reader. I enter the price of the couch. Swipe Jason's card. Let's see that again. Swipe evenly and smoothly while keeping pressure on the hand. Look at that. And the information gets sent quickly and securely for authorization. I can even enter the number manually if I don't have my card reader. And since Jason is already a member of Square, I can even see a picture to confirm it's really him. 
not just ideas. Ideas are still great. We need them every day. Don't write them off. But live for those insights and listen from within. The insights, they're not out there like this. They're, they're inside. That's it. Thank you.